Hello friends, good afternoon and welcome to EduSat live lectures. Dear friends, today in biotechnology we will be discussing about bioluminescence and its biological biochemical aspects. To discuss this topic we have with us our subject expert Dr. Unnati Gulati. Dr. Gulati is academic coordinator in consortium for educational communications. Without further ado, I would like to welcome ma'am to our studios and request her to start the lecture. Welcome ma'am. Thank you Amrit. Welcome friends. Uh, today's lecture is on bioluminescence. We study this topic under biochemistry as well as zoology where we talk about the uh, fireflies and we uh, learn about the structure of the fireflies. Also in this lecture we will be talking about what is bioluminescence, what all organisms we encounter which show bioluminescence. We will study briefly about the biochemical mechanisms and some of the applications that are uh, relevant for molecular biology and imaging, we will deal with them. So, starting with the lecture, we study bioluminescence and bioluminescence is a phenomena of production or emission of light by a living organism. So, this organism will use the chemical energy and will emit photons or will give light energy. This process in bio, in uh, uh, living organisms is 100 percent efficient and it is called as cold light because there is no simultaneous production of heat which is very necessary also otherwise heat production can cause damages to the organism. This is a chemilumin chemiluminescence type of luminescence and it requires certain enzymes. So, bioluminescence is encountered across the kingdoms that we know about 17 phyla are known to have organisms which show luminescence. There are cephalopods, copepods, so these are most of your mollusks, your uh, octopuses, shrimps and uh, uh, deep sea fishes. Not just in the sea, you also encounter these in the terrestrial, generally in the insects like in the fireflies, glowworms and click beetles and in some moths which are the dipteras. Also you can find it in some luminous fungi. There are certain bacteria also which show bioluminescence and when these bacteria they uh, invade the host they show this property of or they lend this property of bioluminescence to the host organism as well. But there are no documented mammals or plants which show bioluminescence. Also very few or none are existing in the freshwater lakes. Most of them would be occurring in the sea system. You can find them in the pelagic region or intertidal region. Intertidal region is the region which is near to the shores or it is found in the abysmal or which is the very dark uh, area of the sea where there is no penetration of sunlight. So, these or these uh, bioluminescent Organis organisms have specialized organ organs which could be distributed across maybe it is present in their gut or it is on their skin, maybe it is, pre is it, it is emitted when they are trying to defend against the prey or it could be present as an organ outside their body as we see in the angler fish. So, they have the photocells which contain either the bacteria which are bioluminescent or we will see as in higher organism which is our firefly, we will see how the photocell is composed of uh, peroxisomes containing the luciferin luciferase system. So, where all do you find these organisms? These are found mainly in the tropical waters, in the intertidal bays and coral reefs which are very nutrient rich areas. And they do give rise to blooms. Blooms are occurrences of high growth in the, uh, the uh, zooplanktons or planktons under which they might produce toxic substances and when ingested by larger organisms causes their death. So, bl blooms are uh, uh, a hazardous phenomena. The blooms may occur as red tides which is uh, caused by the dinoflagellates 
and these red or blue uh, brown tides when they are observed sometimes at the night time also may result in bioluminescence. So, uh, another example is the midshipman uh, fish and let us now talk about what is the light and what is the spectrum which we are talking about when we are talking about luminescence. We will not find the complete spectrum of visible light available in the bioluminescent organisms, but there is as in case of marine organisms, there is only a slight penetration of light in preferably in the green and the blue region. So, as we can see from this diagram, red light will penetrate only till your intertidal region and then after we are getting into the benthic and pelagic region, there is only yellow light and beyond which there is only green and blue light. As we go deeper into the sea, most of the light that is available is in the blue region. The organisms as we found deeper in the sea will be either white in color or will be white or black, will have very different habits and physiology uh, and structure as compared to the organisms in the higher, uh, in the higher uh, depths. So, as the depths increase, we will see very different physiology. Similarly, the color of bioluminescence which we will see will also depend on the protein that is going to cause and in the lecture further we will discuss what all type of proteins are there. Then it will depend on the organism, the, uh, the host and the invading bacteria. So, mostly in the marine species we will find that the region will be in the blue 450 to uh, 510 nanometer while in the terrestrial such as in the fireflies and the click beetles we will find more of a yellow to green bioluminescence. So, this is because it will have maximum transmission of light at this particular wavelength. Also when we look at marine organisms they are more sensitive to blue and green light. So, how does this mechanism of bioluminescence comes about? You will see that bioluminescence is an energy taking up process as in case of firefly it does require ATP. Also in other organisms you will, you will see that bioluminescence requires synthesis of com compounds and intermediate molecules and proteins other than their uh, normal metabolism. So, what is the need and what are the benefits does an organism have when they show bioluminescence? So, we can say that the basic mechanism of bioluminescence comes about from the oxygen toxicity that was prevalent in the uh, primitive earth and the organisms needed some mechanism to uh, prevent the oxidative damage to their uh, newly formed cells. So, for that mechanism they had developed a monooxygenase. Generally monooxygenases are those enzymes which attach a hydroxyl group and they break down the, uh, the oxy oxygen. But most of the monooxygenase require either an iron or iron uh, uh, sulfur center which is their reaction center or as in case of bacterial uh, uh, lumin uh, luciferase it requires a, a cofactor which is FMN. But as you gradually see the monooxygenases that are present in firefly or in ranella will not be having metal or any cofactor. So, this mechanism was inherent to deal with the oxygen toxicity where the chemical bond was broken and the energy was emitted as light. So, it was also a convergent evolution because we do not find just the same mechanism occurring in across all organisms. So, the different uh, starting from bacteria to the fireflies, we will see there are different mechanisms and different enzymes that are catalyzing this reaction. So, there is a different organisms have developed different physical uh, locations of this uh, bioluminescence and they have very different mechanisms. Also, the type of bioluminescence will also be determined by the nutritional and the and the need for of the organism to survive in its ecosystem. So, what is bioluminescence and what it is not? 
Bioluminescence is not fluorescence as we generally think about uh, fluorescence and bioluminescence. Yes, we will talk about fluorescence when we will talk about the green fluorescent protein, but that is not bioluminescence and that is not chemical uh, breakdown of, uh, that is not uh, breakdown of a chemical structure and release of energy. So, nor is bioluminescence a type of incandescence. Incandescence you encounter when you have heated uh, filaments as in your light bulb or as seen here in a hot rod which is heated to very high temperatures and it starts emitting light. Neither it is phosphorescence. Phosphorescence is a phenomena which is similar to fluorescence in which incident light is absorbed by a chemical organic molecule and it undergoes excitation. It goes undergoes excitation, the molecule uh, then goes to a higher energy state and then relaxes back but with a time delay. So, there is a delayed, a delayed emission while in case of fluorescence there is immediate uh, emission of light. So, nor is bioluminescence a coloration. We, fee, we see so many marine animals which uh, corals which are beautifully colored but they are not a type of bioluminescence. So, this diagram also explains very quickly what is bioluminescence and what is fluorescence. In bioluminescence there is catalytic or enzymatic uh, breakdown of a structure you requiring some cofactors requiring oxygen to give rise to oxyluciferin and inorganic phosphate and AMP and carbon dioxide. While in case of fluorescence only there is excitation and there is a, a slight uh, readjustment or reshuffling in the bonds and then they come back to their ground state. So, in chemiluminescence the excited states are the product of exothermic chemical reactions. Here I am saying exothermic but here the energy which is released is in the form of photons. So, while in case of fluorescence the excited states are created by absorption of light and of the compound going to the higher energy level. So, in chemiluminescence photons are not required to create the excited state and they do not constitute an inherent background when measuring photon efflux from a sample and hence this, this becomes a a very deciding factor in why now the assays, the biochemical assays that we do are shifting towards chemiluminescence and not just fluorescence. So, these examples we will see in our applications. So, we will see what are luciferins and what are these uh, light emitting systems. As I was saying that there is not just one type of mechanism or one type of uh, a uh, catalyst or a substrate, there can be several across different uh, organisms. So, in bacterial luciferin, we will have a derivative of riboflavin which is occurring, we will see the structure of it. In dinoflagellates, we have a chlorophyll like molecule and we will see their structures. So, this is bacterial luciferin and it is having this FMN type of structure, you can see the three rings. So, this is reduced FMNH2 which is oxidized in association with a long chain aldehyde oxygen and a bacterial type luciferase. Then dinoflagellates have a different one. So, in this one we are seeing the picture of gonulax at pH 8. There is no activity, there is no bioluminescence, but when the pH is low, it emits bioluminescence. So, and this is the structure I was talking about which is chlorophyll like, the pyrrole ring. So, this is uh, cypridina type of luciferin or vargulin type. I, uh, so, these are from the sh uh, seed shrimps vargula and cypridina. I would like to say that cypridina was the organism that first was studied by Osumura who received the Nobel Prize in 2008 for discovering bioluminescence and he discovered GFP. So, the, his experience by working with cypridina gave him further experience to work with Aquaria Victoria. Then we have silenterazine which is the most popular of the, organ, uh, the uh, systems that we are working and the protein we get here is the echorin. This is the picture of a jellyfish and jellyfish we will study that it is not just one pigment that is existent, there are two pigments 
so, uh, one is a pigment which is chemiluminescent and the other one is the green fluorescent protein which is not a chemiluminescent but a fluorescent molecule. So, here we are seeing what does the selenterazine which is similar to a luciferin but very different in the structure. So, the substrates are very different. This is the substrate in firefly luciferin and this will be occurring when we will talk about luciferase and this is what we use for most of our assays. So, another thing is when we are seeing so many mechanisms across different organisms, there are also variations in the color, but we see that there is predominance of blue to green in the marine and yellow to green in the terrestrial organisms. So, it will differ with what type of substrate luciferin as we have discussed the four substrates previously. So, it depends on the substrate which is the luciferin, it will differ, uh, depend on the luciferase catalyst and also it will depend on the accessory proteins as I was talking about GFP in case of aquaria. So, these bioluminescent are not always occurring, they are not uh, housekeeping, they may be induced by either uh, nerve or uh, nutri nutrition or other metabolic needs or they may be induced when they are when the organism is either threatened by a predator or if it is trying to catch a prey by itself. Also it is uh, required for uh, mate selection as in case of fireflies. So, as we see there are also mechanisms which are entirely unrelated across different organisms. So, they could be bacteria which will have photochemicals that are present throughout the cyto cytoplasm and they glow continuously without flashing while fireflies will show a very characteristic flashing. So, the mechanism of firefly flashing is very interesting. Uh, they are able to recognize male and the female is able to recognize the male by the duration of the flashes and this uh, mechanism is uh, controlled un under uh, nitrous oxide, we will see that mechanism also. Then dinoflagellates also have a localized light producing organelle which is regulated by pH as we saw that under pH 8 there was no bioluminescence, at pH 6 there was bioluminescence. And then certain worms and also you will see in sealant rates their flashes or the light uh, the illuminescence the luminescence is controlled by calcium depolarization. So, basic principle is preserved, but its physiological implementations can be extremely variegated. So, when I say it is very uh, physiological implications, we can talk about what is the bioluminescence used for. It can be used as a defense mechanism when in the night time when you are when the uh, organism is trying to distract the prey and either it may try to make the primary predator visible to a larger secondary predator like the dinoflagellates they come uh, they form a bloom or a aggregation and also it can be used as camouflage in the mid ocean depths where there is slight uh, penetration of light and uh, some squids they have symbiotic association because they cannot make their own uh, bioluminescent uh, substrate so they use bioluminescent bacteria and they try to match with their surrounding environments. Also it is a defense mechanism, some organisms like this uh, shrimp here ejects the, the fluorescent, uh, fluorescent uh, catalyst as well as the substrate into the water and distracts the prey. It can also be used by this cookie cutter shark to just highlight only a dark area and then rest of it is merged with the surrounding water. Then uh, this way it is able to lure larger, anim uh, larger animals to the, as their prey. Then we have uh, the black dragon fish which has two types of luminescent organs, one is a red emitting which is near its eye and another is a green. 
so the uh, green one is able to attract the prey while the red which uh, ha which has the capability of producing long ir re uh, rates is able to uh, it, it helps the organism to see under uh, dark conditions so the organism is able to see the prey but the prey is attracted by the small green uh, dot of light so there can be signals and attracting signals for mates also in this diagram below of an angler fish it has a dorsal spine which is uh, uh, having symbiotic uh, bacteria which which are used as an angler for catching the prey and uh, it can also be used as a method of communication we will see further how uh, bacteria have a mechanism of quorum sensing and when it is produce when it is present in a uh, concentration or in a population it will show the phenomena of bioluminescence but if it is present at very low uh, concentration or in very less numbers it will not show bioluminescence so we'll discuss that so there is a world of bioluminescent organs which uh, organisms which are present and these are some of the characteristic ones let's talk about the bioluminescent bacteria so these are the most widely distributed you will find them on land you will find them in the sea in the uh, on land also they can be associated with organisms they can be symbiotic or they can be parasitic three main genera occur which are the photobacterium which are symbiotic in the light organs and then there is vibrio which could be free these occur in the marine environment while photorhabdus which is uh, encountered in the terrestrial insects so many of these uh, bacteria they infect crustaceans and they give them the benefit of uh, both defense as well as camouflage so when we look at bacterial luciferase this uh, the bottom of this slide will show that there are several c d a b e genes which are responsible so this is the lux operon of the bacteria and these uh, are responsible we will discuss what they are responsible for so the specific growth conditions nutritional requirements and temperature are, and ph are very important for uh, bioluminescence and growth of bacteria the reaction kinetics can be very different so it may vary from one class of bacteria to the other but most of them are rod shaped gram negative with flagellar and they are facultative anaerobes so even in under low supply of oxygen they can uh, survive and grow and that is what we see when they are in their uh, photo organs so the bacterial luciferase is a heterodimer composed of alpha and beta subunits of 40 and 37 kilodalton and they are encoded by the lux a and b gene as we saw in the operon the other genes c d and e are responsible for the c is responsible for the reductase d is for the synthetase and e is for the transferase and they are very important when they are regenerating the substrate we will see the substrate here is an aldehyde and this is the reaction which occurs when bacterial luciferase is producing blue to green light so this is the fmn h2 which is the substrate and this is the this is the alpha and the beta subunit and the alpha subunit has the uh, active site so the requirements are fmn h2 oxygen and fatty aldehyde so this uh, this uh, luciferase catalyzes the reaction gives blue green light and releases fmn h2o and a fatty acid the fatty acid has to be regenerated and fmn has to be redu uh, reduced finally back to fmn h2 and that is where the genes uh, c d and e are responsible for so uh, these are the long chain al uh, fatty acid aldehydes long chain aldehydes which could be 8 to 10 chain long and they are the substrate for uh, for uh, this reaction so the substrates of bacterial luciferase are reduced flavin mononucleotide molecular oxygen and long chain fatty aldehyde the excess energy is liberated 
from the oxygen of FMNH2, oxidation of MNH2 and aldehyde with the release of uh, blue green light and reduction of molecular oxygen. Here we are getting H2O, but later in, uh, in firefly we will encounter that there is release of carbon dioxide. So, what is quorum sensing? This is a mechanism of a bacterial cells talking, bacteria talking to each other. Bacteria when they are present, when they invade a host, they are present in very few numbers. The kind of sensing they tell about uh, what is the nutritional status, what is their population, how much they have to in, uh, multiply to invade the organism and these things are uh, is a talking mechanism between the organism using auto inducer molecules, these are organic molecules and these molecules they build up as the as there is a reproduction as there is multiplication of bacteria these uh, auto inducer molecules uh, built up they are autocatalytic and they further increase the bioluminescent uh, mechanism we will see how so auto inducers they built up in the medium and they tell or they are able to uh, sense that are the bacteria increasing in the number so if we when when we start with less number of bacteria in the solution, we may not encounter bioluminescence, but as more and more auto inducers are present in the, sol in the uh, solution, it will induce the mechanism of uh, first activating the Lux operon and then more and more uh, uh, bioluminescence will occur. So, these, uh, this quorum sensing is a very important aspect. We can, a very simple example would be when free Vibrio is present in marine environment, it will not show bioluminescence, but when it invades or it is in a host in either in its uh, photo organ, where they are present in large number in a small space, they will start showing bioluminescence. So, these are some of the auto inducers along with the regulatory proteins and auto inducers they will switch on the Lux CDABE gene. Not only do you, when you are trying to achieve high amount of bioluminescence, not only do we need uh, just the CBDE, but we also need FMN, we also need FMNH2 to be regenerated. So, we need host of other enzymes and uh, metabolites for this reaction. So, first the organism grows to a certain population and then it starts showing the bioluminescent phenomena. So, free luminescent bacteria may not emit light, but under symbiotic conditions they will or in confined environment they will emit high level of light. So, these are organic compounds very easily diffusible and they are able to help the crosstalk between bacteria. Quorum sensing has been a very important topic studied for understanding even disease mechanisms. How does when a pathogen enters into a body, at the, at the very first instance we may not see the symptoms, but it has to reach to a certain extent before all the symptoms can manifest and hence it has been studying, studied for that purpose. So, till now we have seen that there are many organisms with diverse metabolites and with diverse substrates as well as diverse enzymes. Uh, which are catalyzing the bioluminescent re reaction mechanism. So, we have seen till bacteria uh, luciferase, uh, later on we will talk about renilla as well as firefly luciferase.
talk about uh, fireflies. Fireflies are Photinus spiralis belonging to the family of Lampyridae. About 2000 species are known and we also see them in India. We see them all across the temperate and tropical regions and their larvae are called the glowworms and they are seen as a Christmas tree phenomena in many locations. So, the uh, mechanism of bioluminescence in fireflies is located in the luminescent cells or the lanterns and it is uh, and this is the structure of uh, the photocells. So, the, the firefly lantern is located on the ventral abdomen surface very near to the thin cuticle and these are photocytes are arranged radially towards near the trachea. So, in insects we have a mechanism of uh, oxygen uptake by trachea and these, uh, these are where the oxygen is going to be present. So, the photos and we have seen that the mechanism requires oxygen to be present. So, the photocytes are present in a rosette shape around the trachea. The mitochondria are present near the, uh, near the trachea and the, uh, the peroxisomes are present towards the outside. So, luciferin luciferase is present in the peroxisomes and the photocyte mitochondria are found towards the periphery of the cytoplasm towards the trachea and the tracheoles. Also very important uh, uh, enzyme we encounter here is the nitric oxide synthase and this is occurring in the photocyte organ and it is located at the center of each lantern rosette. Nitric oxide is very important for signaling in the, uh, in the firefly. It has been seen that if there is an artificial splurge of uh, nitric oxide in the environment the firefly starts showing flashes quite frequently. So, nitric oxide under a neurotransmitter regulates how flashes occur and as we discussed before these flashes are similar to the dance that insects perform for, uh, before mating and for mate selection. So, when, we, when the organism is in inactive mode, they, it is taking up the oxygen during this the mitochondria will undergo oxidative phosphorylation and hence AT will be, ATP will be generated. So, during the dark reaction ATP is produced and this further uh, activates the luciferin adenyl intermediate. So, the luciferase attaches a AMP molecule onto the luciferin and this luciferin adenyl uh, intermediate is the actual substrate for further bioluminescent reaction. This is still the dark reaction is in the flash mode. Now, the, uh, the neurotransmitter octopamine which is released, it activates the NOS, the nitric oxide synthase and this NO diffuses rapidly and inhibits oxygen used by photocyte mitochondria and now oxygen is only delivered through the to the photocytes to the perioxosome where it triggers the light producing reaction. So, we will see that when there is high oxygen content in the cell, the, it will turn on the light production in the perioxisomes. Peroxisomes contain luciferin and luciferin and ATP is uh, present. So, the substrates for uh, luciferase activity is the luciferase enzyme, luciferin the substrate, ATP and oxygen. In this reaction, in the dark reaction we will see uh, luciferin, okay. so in the dark reaction we will see that luciferin uh, takes one molecule of ATP and forms the adenylate and releases inorganic phosphate. Uh, inorganic pyrophosphate and luciferyl adenylate then reacts with oxygen and gives rise to oxyluciferin and AMP and light. Also, there is emission of carbon dioxide. So, when this oxyluciferin is in its keto form, it will give red to green red light, while it is in the enolate form, it will give 
yellow green light so we see a yellow greenish emission of light and the nitrous oxide the uh, it uh, decays and degenerates very fast and hence the flashes don't last for a very long time so these are similarly in the firefly case here also we are seeing some of the organisms here also lh2 is the uh, luciferin and how it is interacting and giving rise to photons so some of them require nadph some of them do not require some of them have a requisition for calcium and we will see those mechanisms so luciferin and luciferase mechanism here we will look at this mechanism so it has firefly luciferase have has very high specificity for atp and this is also used in its assay if we are trying to do some biochemical assay where we are trying to monitor atp it is not very easy to uh, monitor atp uh, uptake or atp generation so in that case we rely on fire uh, luciferase type of reactions type of coupled reactions to find how much atp is present so luciferase first converts the d luciferin d hydroxy luciferin d uh, lh2 into the enzyme bound luciferyl adenylate so the lh2 plus amp is the activated form and this is now ready for subsequent oxidation by oxygen so here we see the d fluorify luciferin requires atp atp of course always requires magnesium to stabilize the long chain of phosphate and then luciferyl amp is formed in organic phosphate this further gives rise to oxygen uh, will break down either oxygen will grow as a co2 and oxygen will be attached to the luciferyl component Uh, to the luciferyl and hence here it will release the carbon dioxide this oxygen remains and it becomes the excited species it can be oxyluciferin enolate form and this could be, could be also the keto form so these are getting excited and then they release energy as they come to their ground state so we will encounter that in the sea we will have renilla luciferase and on terrestrial we have firefly luciferase a brief comparison is given here so firefly luciferase is a 61 kilo dalton protein and it is different substrate as uh, compared to renilla they use atp so atp is not used in renilla and it produces greenish yellow glow while renilla luciferase produces a blue light and this is also used for dual reporter assays and uh, we will see they can be used as reporter proteins so this is how it is used for further biochemical assays whenever there is atp present we can quantify amount of light produced by it so talking about renilla and aquaria renilla is the sea pansy an organism shown here it is an anthozoan sealant rate and the bioluminescent protein occurs in the photocells this organism not just has one pigment as we just saw luciferin luciferase system this organism has three pigments within this mechanism of production of bioluminescence or light so also this primitive organism shows some sort of nerve net control and there is calcium modulation of production of light as there was nitrous oxide uh, modulation in the luciferase system so you have the first which is the catalytic enzyme like it was the luciferase it is here the renilla luciferin 2 mono oxygenase then this or uh, this organism shows green colored emission although i told before that renilla luciferase gives or marine gives blue colored light so renilla luciferin 2 monooxygenase or renilla luciferase is responsible 
for giving blue colored light but when it is coupled with another protein which is the green fluorescent protein the color of emission changes another protein which is important here is the apoenzyme which is the ranella luciferin binding protein it is a calcium binding protein and this couples the emission of light to calcium signaling so depolarization of calcium levels of calcium in the surroundings and in the water and potassium uh, depolarization are important for signaling the emission of light so ranella luciferis is a monomer it may also occur as a di or tri and the monomeric form is 35 kilo dalton it has a single binding site with a very high kd of 3 into 10 to the power minus 8 moles Uh, luciferase oxyluciferase mono and complex is the excited state as we previously saw the keto and the enol forms were the excited states and they emit blue colored light so ranella and other cylindrates like aquaria also have a uh, a sensitizer protein which is the green fluorescent protein and the actual color which of uh, which is emitted by ranella is green due to the lambda of 580 nanometer this protein is a dimer of 58 kilo dalton it has a barrel beta barrel structure and it has it is able to um, uh, complex it is able to transfer efficiently the energy from the uh, ranella uh, luciferase to the gfp so what happens is after the luciferin the after the ranella luciferin oxidation the product which was the mono, luciferin oxidase monoanion formed uh, the product this um, the luciferase oxyluciferase monoanion complex this product is able to increase its quantum yield almost 2 to 200 times and once the quantum yield is increased this transfers the energy by the mechanism of fret which is forster's resonance energy transfer and there is a complexation a brief complexation that occurs in which one luciferase gets complexed with the one gfp molecule to give all the uh, light emitted to the gfp molecule so another component is the luciferase binding protein and this protein is able to uh, sense it, sense the calcium present and hence it is used as a, it is used as a modulator of the bioluminescence so the lpb is a single polypeptide which is of 18.5 kilo dalton it has two calcium binding sites and this is uh, this binds to the briefly binds to the luciferin for a very short period of time in a non non covalent bond and when there is no calcium there is no binding to the luciferin and when calcium is present this lbp is able to bind luciferin and luciferin is then further available to be acted upon by luciferase so this can be induced by potassium depolarization and when the photocyte membrane is impulsed and uh, with this depolarization there is uptake of calcium and this calcium then further is able to cause bioluminescence by binding of the lpb to the luciferin then we will talk about another cylindrate uh, which is aquaria victoria it is a very famous organism now that uh, 2008 nobel prize in chemistry was awarded for the gfp protein so it was discovered as uh, so aquarin was the or uh, the molecule which is similar to luciferin luciferase system but later on we studied mo this organism more for its gfp so aquarin it is a single polypeptide chain of 20 kilo dalton it also has two calcium binding sites and one mole of luciferin is already always bound to it and there is regeneration of aquarin in the presence of in the absence of calcium 
So it doesn't occurs as aquarin, it occurs as an apoprotein where already oxygen is bound, where already the luciferin is bound to it. So it forms the apoprotein. So this is what aquarin uh, apoprotein looks like. It will, it has high capacity to bind calcium. Once bound to calcium, it will release the sealant aramide. So, this is the molecule which is it is uh, the sealant arazine which is similar to the luciferin as in the and the as the firefly, but here we have sealant arazine. So, aquarin is binding which is the enzyme, aquarin then after binding to calcium releases the sealant arazine as sealant aramide and releases one of the calcium and apoaquorin is again released for regeneration. So, the photoprotein aquarin binds with 2 calcium and decomposes into sealant aramide, CO2 and apoaquorin and there is blue emission of light. So, six, uh, so we see that 465 nanometer uh, wavelength of blue light is emitted, but when we see renella fluorescence, it is green in color and how does it happen? It is because of the green fluorescent protein. As we said, it has a beta barrel with 11 uh, uh, beta, uh, beta sheets in a barrel form. You can see it as a circular barrel. The main component of the chromophore is a, uh, here it is a fluorophore. It is the 50, 65th to 67th amino acid containing serine, tyrosine and glycine. So, there is uh, this, uh, these three amino acids are present, but they undergo a certain uh, oxidative cyclization and then it forms the fluorophore. So, we will see the uh, fluorophore here is the p hydroxybenzylidine imidazolidone and the cyclized backbone of these residues forms this imidazolidone ring which is responsible for fluorescence. And when it, when I am talking about fluorescence, I mean that there has to be an absorption of a particular wavelength of light and then emission of a, a higher wavelength of light. So, here we see that there is excitation of blue light and there is emission of green light which is of higher wavelength 580 and absorption of a 460 nanometer light. So, Briefly, uh, I will talk about what does this uh, cyclization is. We are seeing that there is a glycine when uh, this is how it is attached to the protein backbone, but when they all come close together, they show cyclization. Then the imidazole uh, ring formation occurs, dehydration occur and now we have a chromophore which is the mature GFP. So, we will talk about aquarin and definitely we will talk about the Nobel Prize as we were discussing for the discovery and development of the GFP. The three scientists that are very important for this are Osamu Shimomura and then there is a Martin Chalfi and Roger Sine. Uh, so, Shimomura worked with Cypridia, Cypridia which was the a uh, small seed shrimp as I had shown before and he had great experience in uh, extracting and crystallizing uh, light, light emitting proteins. So, he captured lot of jellyfish from the Japanese sea and they extracted uh, the protein and the story is very exciting how he uh, got large amounts of uh, uh, large amounts of jellyfish from the sea and lot of effort was done and so many serendipitous activities occurred then finally crystallization of that protein could occur. Then not just he was he was looking for aquarin which was a luciferase kind of a protein, but he encountered GFP which was the green fluorescent protein. In Cypridia he was looking for uh, vargolin type or Cypridia type of luciferin and also in uh, aquarin he was trying to find that kind of a protein with the catalyst, but serendipitously they found GFP. Later GFP was 
our GFP gene was found, it was cloned into a bacteria and this was done by another person which was Douglas Prasher and he had first started the cloning mechanism or first started cloning the GFP gene into bacteria, but he was unable to find a gene product or the protein which could show bioluminescence. So, in a way his experiment was a failure, but another scientist uh, Martin Shalfi, he chopped some parts of the gene of the GFP, removed certain uh, redundant uh, portions and then again tried to uh, synthesize it uh, recombinantly and was successful in creating a GFP protein which showed uh, fluorescence phenomena in in vitro. So, this uh, and what he did with that was the onset of uh, doing lot of studies regarding developmental biology and doing studying uh, studying protein 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 interactions. He cloned it into Cenorhabditis which is C. elegans and he was mapping the proteins in the worm in the nematode. So, this was when see this is the image of uh, C. elegans and you can see nerve endings which have become fluorescent and all those uh, nerves which are getting uh, which are fluorescing are expressing the GFP protein. So, this was the start of uh, gene switches and start of molecular biology using GFP. Then is the contribution of Roger Seen. He was able to take the GFP and do uh, protein mechanics and protein molecular engineering. In a way, he tried to change the structure of the a chromophore which we saw was the 3 amino acid uh, cyclization, he was able to change the color of that and gave rise and was able to produce a variety of colors. So, now what you can do is not just you have to depend on GFP yellow color, you have a wide number of colors available, uh, these proteins can be tagged onto different cells or different molecules and we can study interaction of even complex. Uh, uh, signaling and we can uh, talk about uh, complex uh, cascades and mechanisms. So, this is the contribution of uh, Roger sign and with these we can this is an example in which uh, just a biologist who is a protein scientist is able to crystallize a protein is able to understand its, uh, its importance and how a molecular biologist is able to take the same concept and use it to study uh, how development occurs and how a, a protein architect is able to modulate the structure of a protein and give rise to so many variants. So, in all the study of all these three helps us in utilizing GFP in more th than one ways. And what are these applications we can do with bioluminescence? We can definitely one is this very uh, uh, funny picture of uh, the glowfish. This is a zebra fish which has been uh, genetically modified and this fish is not just aesthetically to, uh, good to look at, but also when this fish is present under uh, highly polluted environments when there are lot of endocrine disrupting molecules present in the environment these fish start to grow. So, they can be used as biomolecule uh, biomarkers for monitoring pollution. So, what is the mechanism behind it? Similarly, as we saw there is a, a gene switch. So, if you put a gene switch and a GFP and a protein which will only be switched on in the presence of a certain uh, inducer which can be an environmental pollutant only then fluorescence will occur otherwise this will be switched off. So, for that we have this uh, glowfish then we can utilize bio, uh, bacterial bioluminescence. Bacterial bioluminescence has lot of ex, um, applications even in food industry even when we are uh, trying to study uh, take these genes out and recombinantly add to other orga organisms 
then uh, we can do BRET which is bioluminescent resonant energy transfer. We can see GFP and Aquaria are natural examples of BRET. It can help us to know more about gene expression and regulation. We know that gene expression and regulation are not just uh, one molecule or one protein interaction. There are several components that are important in transcription regulation. So, bioluminescent markers can be used for that. Identification of bacterial contamination in food. When there is more of bacteria growing in the food, what is the state of ATP that is present can be monitored by Lucifer and Luciferase activity and of course for entertainment and expression, but that is strictly under ethical grounds. Under ethical, uh, it has to be discussed under ethicals and morals of using such GM interventions. Then we have bioluminescent reporters. All these green fluorescent proteins which are fluorescent fluorophores or you are using uh, Vrenilla or luciferin luciferase type of mechanisms. Both have very different uh, applications. When we are using bioluminescent uh, reporters such as GFP, we can talk about uh, uh, we can talk about we can talk about uh, GFP uh, for trans for FRET studies. So, if we have RNA polymerase and that FRET study can be used for two yeast to hybrid kind of systems when you have one which is an emitter and one which is an absorber. So, once you have an emitter of a luciferase kind attached to one of the yeast and the second one is an, an absorber or a prey or a, a predator, then we can uh, see their interaction. Here is an example of a reporter gene. Here if the RNA polymerase is aligned and all the transcription factors are present and we have inserted the luciferase gene downstream, this luciferase upon transcription activation will produce light otherwise not. If there is higher expression of this particular gene then there will be higher emission, higher quantity, uh, quantity uh, of light, higher quanta of light. Like in this trans act, uh, acting factor, we can see that the GFP is attached here downstream and when the regulatory region is switched on, there is high levels of GFP, otherwise there is very low or null GFP. So, we can study a uh, report of protein abundance and stability, we can use it to study imaging, it is a non-invasive method in which we can localize the uh, mutants or cancerous cells with uh, GFP and luciferase type of uh, genes can be induced. We can do bread studies which can tell us about uh, interaction of two components even in yeast to hybrid. Then, uh, we can study uh, ubiquitination, gene expression can be observed without invasion. So, these are some of the applications of bioluminescence and the students now should be thinking about how it is produced, what are the creatures that emit bioluminescence, what are the reasons the, uh, the creatures are emitting bioluminescence, what colors occur and why. And what question remain is what is the need and what can we do with it. So, thank you very much. Uh, on that note, I would like to thank ma'am for this very enriching discussion and I would like to thank you dear friends for watching, watching our show. Stay tuned and keep watching. Thank you.